Participating in sports can be good for youth both physically and mentally. But from concussions to stress, there are concerns about youth sports as well. We'll talk with a Nebraska sports medicine specialist and an expert from Boys Town about how families can get the most out of sports while staying safe. That's tonight on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks for joining us on Speaking of Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thousands of Nebraska children and teens participate in sports every year, but the landscape of youth sports is changing. Fewer kids nationwide are playing a team sport on a regular basis. Here in Nebraska, over the past 10 years, fewer high school students are participating in football, basketball, and volleyball. Meanwhile, cross country, tennis, and soccer participation is up significantly. Increased awareness about concussions and other injuries may have contributed to the recent decline in contact sports. But the long-term physical and mental benefits of playing a team sport in adolescence are well documented. We asked a few parents and grandparents at a local youth baseball field about how they perceive the benefits and the risks. Oh, I think it's a great family activity. We all go and support each other and cheer on with whatever kid is playing. So it's a, a good family activity and I think it teaches the kids responsibility and commitment and working as a team to get a goal accomplished. Well, socializing with his friends for one thing, but I think it builds character, but also keeps them away from the technology. I think a, little, a lot of that's going on. So gets the kids out and gets them the good old fashioned fresh air and gives them exercise. They learn to work with different personalities. They learn to get along with people. They learn teamwork. Uh, it just helps them become a better person uh, in their life. And it'll, it'll what they learn today will carry on. After the last several years, you know, probably going back a number of years, seeing the research and the evidence of, of what can happen to people that play football for a long period of time or even a short period of time. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not sad to see them not playing football. Joining us now are Dr. Dane Todd of Nebraska Orthopedic and Sports Medicine and Angie Knott, an English teacher and a track and basketball coach at Boys Town. Thank you both for being with us and not only experts in your field, but you're also both former Husker athletes. I wanted to mention up top so you know what you're talking about. Uh, Angie Knott, a University of Nebraska track athlete, three-time Big 12 champion and a 10-time All-American who's been inducted into the Nebraska High School Sports Hall of Fame. Welcome to Speaking of Nebraska. Thank you. And Dr. Dane Todd with Nebraska Orthopedics and Sports medicine, a former Husker fullback, three-time first team academic all Big 12, and the Walter Byers scholarship winner, which is awarded to the nation's top student athletes. So thank you for being with us as thank well. Thank you. We're going to talk youth sports and uh, everything from health risks to building character, but Dr. Todd, I'll start with you. Getting kids active young would seem to be a good thing from a health standpoint, and when it comes to that good health, are there risks for children starting too young in sports? There really aren't major risks for starting too young. You can overdo things for sure. And one of the things we're finding is sports specialization at a very early age actually impedes their development as athletes and increases their risk uh, for injury later on. So we know it's good for kids to be active early, but does that carry over into adulthood? Do you find that kids who are active at a young age are more likely to be active as adults? Yeah, without a question. We see kids, with the earlier they start doing sports and activities or just living active lifestyles, playing at the park, going on walks, going on bike rides, the more likely those things are to carry over as they're adults and they're, they'll be healthier, healthier in the future. Angie Knott, you've been participating in sports throughout your life. What would you say to a parent who is weighing the risks and benefits of letting their child participate in sports? What would be your advice to them? Well, just look at the program you're entering. Sports are a great way for them to, to build character, to meet people, to practice some of the skills that you learn in the home. So as they're, they're looking at the risk and benefits, it's... Uh, yeah, the best thing is the way the program. It just depends on the program. 
so there's a lot of research that shows sports can have a very positive impact on, on kids and adults. So as, a, as an athlete and a coach, can you look back on your career and maybe think about teammates or even students that you've coached that have really been positively impacted by sports? And I've been in good programs. I think that as far as, again, building relationships, maybe you're meeting people that you wouldn't normally interact with in a school. Um, so a little bit of diversity. You learn how to work with others. Just on a job, you might have to work with people with different personalities, not just the kids tend to pick the people that they want to hang with, and it makes them go outside their box. Um, it's also a motivation for, for academics, because if you want to be, some kids, they need that sport to motivate them to get their grades up. And some of them, they learn that motivation on the field, and then they can take that into the classroom. And how can a parent help a child find the right sport for them? You know, I'm going to go with Dr. Dane. You start young, and you don't want to overdo one. Um, just let them try, as long as they're having fun at a, a very young age. Um, allow them to have fun, short camps, uh, watching would, would help. As they get older, to find out what they're good at, you could ask coaches, watch their motivation level, their, you know, their reaction to, to the group and the team to see if it's a positive impact. Um, you can also look at, at a young age. Just kind of watch yeah. them a little bit and kind of see how they're reacting to it. Yeah. What I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add? No, I agree with that completely. You put them in multiple different activities when they're young, let them try different things for short periods of time, and you'll see what kids like and enjoy doing, what they look forward to going into. Sure, at the beginning, it might be you putting them into something, but at some point, they're going to self-select themselves out to the things they really enjoy. So there's a lot of positives for youth uh, participating in sports, but there's also some risks, especially in a contact sport, say like football. We're talking about uh, the possibility of concussions. We have one to two million children and adolescents who suffer sports or recreation-related concussions each year. NET Sports produced a documentary called Concussions Heading for Change that you can watch on our website. And I want to play a short clip from that documentary that illustrates what happens during a concussion. And then I want to ask you a little bit about it. During linear acceleration, the head's forward motion is stopped by a direct impact. Inside, the brain keeps moving, crashing into the skull. A lateral impact, like a cross punch in boxing, can cause rotational acceleration where the brain spins on its axis. Players with a concussion are more susceptible to receiving another especially within a 10-day window from the initial injury. A rapid succession of concussions is called second impact syndrome. So Dr. Todd, when it comes to young children, what's the kind of impact that they're feeling with that kind of force? Is it different than an adult would feel? It's difficult to say whether or not it's completely different, but the impacts are definitely different. We all, a lot of times we look at young children and maybe not having the same forcefulness of impact as you see with our collegiate and professional athletes. However, at the same time, we have to keep in mind that their brains are still developing, their bodies are still developing, and the size difference between two six-year-olds can be markedly different from that of two 18-year-olds. And so there can be a, a big disparity in the amount of force applied to one another. So the, the impacts, regardless of how, how much we think they're different between children and adults, the impacts all add up. So what are the precautions that parents can take or even demand to keep their children safe when it comes to concussions? Sure. So especially if you're playing in contact sports, you know, football, ice hockey, collision sports, teaching appropriate technique for uh, tackling and blocking is paramount. Also, keeping a good eye on players and, and the young athletes for signs and symptoms of concussions and being very quick to pull the trigger on getting them out of the game and resting them. We always have to keep in mind that even though, yeah, the sports might be one of the most important parts of that child's life right now, those children are 18 and younger and they have 60 or 70 years left to go. There's plenty of time for sports and activities. And I wanted to kind of add, sure. you know, as a coach, and we, we talked about going in young, teaching them the again, the foundations, the basics, the technique, younger, and allowing them to 
to maybe go full contact or take on more of the sport when you get older, that's a precaution that parents can take. Um, just learning the, like the games, the movements, the rules will keep them in the game longer, mm -hmm. like you're saying, and keep them away from that, that injury. Dr. Dane Todd with us, as well as Angie Nott, a coach at Boys Town. And uh, Dr. Todd, medically speaking, when a concussion does happen, talk to us about the concussion protocol and what an athlete needs to go through in order to get back on the field. Sure, so the first step is to remove them from the competition and all the athletics. You want a good period of brain rest. So no strenuous activities, no excessive exercising. And it's a very stepwise progression into gradually progressing athletic activity and exertional activities really over the course of about a week to 10 days. Every step of the way, they have to be completely symptom free before they can move on to the next step. If you start experiencing any headaches, any dizziness, any nausea, um, lightheadedness, any sort of symptom, then you have to stop completely, back up a step, and then try again the next day. So, um, Coach Nott, I want to ask you a little bit about um, some research that shows that when kids play multiple sports, instead of that sports specialization that we were talking about earlier, they're less likely to be injured than kids who specialize in one sport. So, as a coach, do you want your athletes to just focus on one sport, or do you want them to play multiple sports? Multiple sports. Not only because of the athletic part, but also the skill part. They are, when they play multiple sports, they're building their whole body. Say if I'm playing basketball, I'm just, you're, you're working more your arms, your legs. You've got to focus baseball, maybe just in your arm. But if I'm to run track, I'm working on my fitness and endurance. I'm working on, you know, strength in the bottom of my legs as well as the top and football you're working on. So it allows them to be well-rounded as an individual and be an, ath an athlete. You know, there's a difference between a basketball player and an athlete. It opens them up to new opportunities and, and teaches them that and gives them the opportunity to play a different a different sport and maybe find their focus later on once they have mastered those skills. But with all the club teams and the traveling teams that we're seeing, what's the trend? I mean, are you seeing more kids start to specialize? Yes, they are. Um, and it, sometimes it's sad because they'll miss out on their high school season to specialize. Um, but again, the injury comes into play. The, the overuse injuries come into play. And our, you know, our, our teams aren't as good. We're losing. We're losing coaches to the, to the business. Um, it's like they're, they're young, young professionals instead of using that program to just grow and develop as a person and learn lifelong skills. And when we talk about club sports and traveling teams, there's also an expense involved with that. Um, some of the research shows that the higher the income a family has, uh, the more likely it is that their children will be able to participate in sports. So I guess my question is, should we be concerned that lower income children aren't getting the same opportunities and training when it comes to sports as children from higher income families? I, I do believe it's a problem um, because if you can't afford that trainer, that's $50 an hour or if you can't um, make it to certain gyms or pay certain coaches the fees they're asking for, we have kids that are missing out. And again, it's not just the athletic play, it's also that social skill aspect, that life skill aspect that they're missing out on. So Dr. Todd, when it comes to sports injuries, what are the most common injuries that you see from youth? Oh, sure. So there's a myriad of injuries, obviously, and it's very sport specific. We'll see a lot of lower extremity knee injuries, especially in our soccer players. Once you move on to the more contact sports like football, you see a lot of shoulder injuries, uh, hand injuries. Of course, you still see knee injuries in a sport like that. And then you move on to baseball, where the vast majority of our injuries tend to be overuse related injuries, shoulder related, elbow related. So everything runs the gamut. It just depends on what activities kids are participating in. And what advice would you have to parents if their child is injured? When do you know it's time to seek medical attention? Sure, so the first thing to do, and it's often the hardest thing to do is to pull them back. You need to pull out of sports for a short period of time. Most things, as long as there wasn't a very definite acute injury to it with a with an obvious pop with immediate swelling those sorts of things can actually just be rested for a week or so with a gradual return to sports once we start seeing pain to the point where we can't walk appropriately without badly limping when we see increased significant swelling immediately or just pain that's not getting better over the course of about a week of of conservative treatments then you need to get them in to be seen 
Coach Angie Nott of Boys Town, I want to ask you a little bit about a philosophy at Boys Town that you've written about called competing with character. Yes. What is that philosophy and how does it play out on the field for the student athletes? Competing with character teaches children, again, not just the competitive side, but to, to win with uh, pride and lose with dignity, to follow your coach's instructions. It shows you not only skills that can be applied to sports, but in life. So we take our, our social skills model and try to direct it. For example, instead of listening to your teachers or, or listening, listen to your coaches. And then we explain how, what that looks like. Because it may look different in the classroom than it does on the field. So um, every time we start our season, we sit our, our girls down, our boys down. We have a poster. We give them cards. And, and we tell them, hey, remember, we have to respect our equipment and our facilities and teach them what that looks like, which could carry on in adulthood, respecting your place of work. That's respecting like, your home. Like a great program. Yes. So in the remaining time that we have here, Dr. Todd, I want to ask you, how far have we come in sports medicine since even the days when you were playing football back in high school or for the Huskers? Things are always changing. Um, I tend to laugh sometimes when I see my older patients who have had procedures done 20, 30 years ago, um, just at where the incisions are placed now. So everything from how you approach injuries to how we fix them, we're recognizing more things that we didn't think were problems in the past, more so probably because we didn't have a solution for fixing them, and now we're recognizing those injuries and taking care of them. And Coach Knott, you get the last word. How do you feel about youth sports? Are, are we making a difference? Is it going in the right direction? I think we are making a difference. We do have to be careful again with injuries starting too soon and having youth do too much. We still want it to be fun. We want to focus. We want people to be Huskers one day, <laughs> but you got to take it slow, learn the social skills aspect, but also learn your sports technique so you can do it in a healthy way. Well put. Thank you both for coming out. Uh, Angie Nott, a coach at uh, Boys Town of track and basketball and also an English teacher and Dr. Dane Todd of Nebraska Orthopedic and Sports Medicine. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. This interview and tonight's program are available on our website. Just go to netnebraska.org slash speaking of Nebraska. The Nebraska legislature ended its 2019 session last week, passing nearly 300 bills, but also not passing major property tax relief. NET Capital reporter Fred Knapp covered the session. And Fred, for you, what stood out as far as what was accomplished? Well, they did some substantive th things. They uh, legalized uh, hemp, a growing of hemp. They raised the smoking and vaping age from 18 to 19. They authorized 384 new prison beds at the Lincoln Correctional Center. They restricted who can be put in solitary confinement. They created more drug and veterans courts, and they gave a property tax break to people whose homes were destroyed or significantly damaged by the flooding earlier this year. But what about that issue that the senators and the governor said going in was probably the top priority for the session, and that was property tax relief? Well, they, they got mixed reviews on what they accomplished on that. Uh, when he gave his closing speech to the legislature, Governor Pete Ricketts uh, struck a positive note. And on my top priority, property tax relief, we have continued to make good progress. You all have increased the property tax credit relief fund by $51 million. By contrast, when Speaker of the Legislature Jim Shear addressed his colleagues a few minutes later, he had a much more negative assessment. There were numerous well-crafted property tax relief pro proposals that came up this year. None of them, none of which received support to pass. For years, agriculture interests have been pushing us for property tax relief, and we've not been able to deliver in a substantial victory. So adding $51 million to the property tax credit fund, as the governor mentioned, seems like a lot of money. So why did Speaker Scheer say there wasn't a substantive victory? Well, $51 million is a lot of money, especially when you add it to the $224 million that's already in that property tax credit fund. But you got to weigh that against the overall size of the property taxes in the state, which is over $4 billion. Um, 
since the property tax credit fund started in 2007, it's grown from $105 million a year to $275 million. But at the same time, property taxes themselves have increased from about two and a half to four billion dollars. I asked Governor Ricketts about this in an interview after his speech. And it has grown but it hasn't held down overall property taxes. Right, and that's one of the reasons why I proposed LRHCA, LRHCA, which is why the Revenue Committee needs to act upon that, because the only way you can have sustainable tax relief is by controlling spending. So the governor talked about LRHCA. What's he referring to? That's his proposed constitutional amendment to the state constitution that would limit local governments to a 3% increase in property taxes year over year. And where does that stand? It had a public hearing. It was in the Revenue Committee. It got some support, including from the committee chairman, Senator Lou Ann Linehan. But then uh, a whole bunch of people who rely on property taxes for the majority of their budget, such as schools, natural resource districts, cities and counties got up and testified against it. So the proposal's still alive and it could come back next year. It could be part of an overall package if they can negotiate it out. So we have a summer full of interim studies and hearings ahead of us, right? Absolutely. All right, Fred Knapp covering the legislature for us. Thank you very much, Fred. Each week on NET Radio, we bring you signature stories that dig deeper into the topics that impact Nebraskans' lives. Next week, tune in for two stories about innovation in our state. On Wednesday, learn how the leaders of Ord, Nebraska, started working together and thinking differently about economic development. And on Thursday, we go inside cutting-edge re research in the University of Nebraska system that's changing human movement research and healthcare education. Listen for those stories during Morning Edition and All Things Considered on NET Radio. And watch NET Television next week for the premiere of the new program, What If? Telling the stories of Nebraskans who answer that simple question with innovation and creativity. What If? Thursday at 8 Central on NET. It's been almost three months since massive flooding washed over parts of Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri. But for many farmers, recovery has been slow. NET News teamed up with the PBS NewsHour this week for a nationally broadcast story on the struggles of farmers in Nebraska. Jack Williams of NET News reports on how a wet spring and lingering high water has delayed planting for many growers who can't afford to miss out on a good crop this season. For Scott Olson, who farms around 3,000 acres of corn and soybeans near the small town of Takema in northeast Nebraska, Getting a good look at his land these days takes more than just a pickup truck. Olson is a farmer, but he's also a pilot and uses his small plane to check on areas he can't access because of high water from the nearby Missouri River. Coming down this road down here, the road that goes into this farm, you can't even get into the farm to get to it. Uh, the water's high enough now, it's coming over the roads. Um, but the entrance into, the other entrance into this field to the north is also underwater. So at this point in time right now, I cannot even get onto my farm ground down there. Olson has been able to plant in some areas, but about 500 acres of his land still looks like a big muddy lake. Losing that flooded land this season could cost him more than $150,000 in income. This year's flooding has hit him harder than big floods in 2011. If you walk across mud, just try to think about running a tractor and a planter across it and see how far you get. You just, you can't touch it. There's nothing you can do with it. It's a story that's being repeated all across the Midwest. Within a two week period, this ground needs to dry out so we can get a crop in. Otherwise our crop will be greatly depleted on it. It's just so doggone wet. I don't see how we're gonna get it done. As farmers fight high water, higher property taxes and a trade standoff with China, they're getting some temporary help from the Trump administration, which announced $16 billion in farm aid late last month. But for farmers like Scott Olson, they'd prefer trade over aid. It's hurting a lot of people. Hopefully our government, and here we go again, our government, you know, I hope they can help us out and get some policies put together and some trade deals put together so we can get a decent price for our commodity. Most growers who haven't been affected by flooding have already planted corn, soybeans, and other crops. 
But for those who have faced cropland, lost to high water and a lot of rain, planting hasn't been an option. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says at this time last year, 90 percent of the corn crop in the nation's 18 biggest corn producing states had been planted. This year, just 67 percent of corn is in the ground. The planting rate for soybeans this year is even worse. When you look at some of this residue, the soil around it's quite wet, but underneath that, it's just straight mud. Agronomist John McNamara says if farmers can't get seed into the ground soon, crop yields will likely fall off sharply. Most farmers have crop insurance that covers their losses during a bad growing season, but delayed planting also means drastically reduced insurance payouts. We do reach a point in June where your expectations for your average yield have got to go down because you don't have enough calendar year to get the crop mature. Uh, and soybeans are different than corn in that you can plant soybeans out into the 10th, 15th of June with little to no yield penalty, but everything else has got to go right. Near Lincoln, Nebraska, Dave Nielsen farms around 2,400 acres, split evenly between corn and soybeans. His land is a little higher and didn't flood in March. But he says it's still been a challenge to plant because of the wet weather. The rain has washed away parts of his fields. We'll have terraces that get potholes full of water, and, but it's a, mainly erosion is what we have problems with when we get heavy rains. Nielsen has been one of the fortunate ones. His corn and soybean crops are going to be okay, but he says he'd like to have someone to sell them to, and the current trade war with China is testing his patience. You gotta rebuild all those connections. You gotta, you know, the sellers and the buyers gotta reconnect and everything. It, it, there's gonna be long-term effects. This isn't, you know, we drop the tariffs and the next day we're shipping as many beans as we did a year ago. That, that's not gonna happen. Back at Scott Olson's place in northeast Nebraska, just across the river from an equally soaked Iowa, a little good news and good weather would go a long way. Corn and soybean prices have rebounded a bit, but it's still a tough way to make a living. This is a challenging year. What, what keeps you going here? Well, just like any other business, I guess you have good years and you have some bad years, but uh, uh, it's something that we've always done. It's always been a way of life. I don't want to give it up. Olson says farming is all about patience and perseverance, and he says he and a lot of other Midwest growers have an abundance of both. Our coverage on flood recovery will continue throughout the year and beyond. Follow along at netnebraska.org slash flood. Well, for the past eight weeks, we've enjoyed bringing you another season of Speaking of Nebraska. If you missed any of our discussions on topics like the Nebraska Supreme Court, Yazidi refugees in the state, teen suicide prevention, and others, you can find them all online. Just visit our website at netnebraska.org slash speaking of Nebraska. You can also find all of our stories on Facebook and Twitter. Just follow us at NET News Nebraska. We look forward to joining you again in the future with more Speaking of Nebraska programs featuring in-depth discussions on significant issues we face in our communities. We always love to hear your feedback as well. Let us know what you think about the program by emailing us at news at netnebraska.org. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for watching and have a great summer.